Okay, everybody, we um, are back. Uh, old friends meeting again. Um, the point of this conversation uh, the, or the idea behind the conversation today is to talk a little bit about politics. Uh, the reason this conversation came to be is because Josh Kearns emailed us just distraught about the state of politics, but now Josh isn't here, so <laughs> maybe he'll show up halfway through the episode um, and give us his thoughts. Um, but basically, I Josh floated this idea that we talk about national politics and we're all kind of like a little ambivalent about it. I think, so my initial response was, I think it's a good idea to be ambivalent on the camera um, because I don't really feel very strongly one way or another this election. And I think probably a lot of people share that opinion. Um, so just thinking through a lot of different things like, you know, do we care about national politics? How are we feeling right now? Um, the state of doomer optimism, I think right now there's a lot of questions again bubbling up because we had this event in Wyoming that was a doomer optimism adjacent and people are now calling it a right wing movement and sort of like disavowing it. Um, and like whether or not we have to be explicitly right wing or left wing. Um, so I'll just stop there and see if anyone else wants to jump in with mm -hmm. a initial thought. Well, I'll say that, I mean, speaking personally, I, I don't really feel like I have anyone to vote for this election. Um, you know, on, you know, on the left, we have, I think, kind of a, a fusion of a woke neoliberal and neoconservative uh, coalition, which I'm not crazy about. And on the right, I mean, I just, I just think Trump is morally depraved. Um, I think you have to be like, closing your eyes or squinting very hard to not see that. Mm. Uh, I also don't like uh, the connections to Thiel and Musk, to the dissonant right. Um, I think that they are the woke right, so to speak, um, the postmodern right. And, you know, I find it very toxic and, and very crazy. And they have a you know direct line to Trump. Mm -hmm. So looking from both sides, you know, I, I live in a very nice place. I kind of live in a shire, so I could. I feel like I kind of could just ignore it and shut it out because people here are pretty normal and uh, people vote one way or the other, but everyone seems to get along. And so it doesn't seem particularly relevant to my life, um, but that could just be because I'm sheltered. Well, I don't know. Mm. Nate, how are you feeling on national politics right now? And then I'll I'll give my little... I, uh, I, I relate a lot to what you just said. It was interesting. <laughs> um, around where I live, there's like, a few political signs here and there, you know, in the in the out here in the country where I live, you see, you know, occasional Trump signs, but not that many. And if you go into town, you see, like you would expect some, you know, Harris Wall signs, um, and a few, you know, you got a couple people in the country with the uh, Harris signs. You got a couple people in town with with Trump, but it's scattered and sparse and not a big deal. And then this weekend, I I spent the weekend up in the driftless in wisconsin shout out to the driftless angler where i got this dope hat <laughs> um and man there were so many signs everywhere it was everywhere i was like oh yeah this is like a life in a battleground state uh, mm -hmm. and i was very grateful to be in a not battleground state where <laughs> no people are here don't talk about it because in a very real sense it doesn't actually matter very much you know like who i like who you vote like it doesn't matter like illinois is going blue and that's just what happens it doesn't really matter um yeah so and that's kind of nice um when you feel you know ambivalent about it um i think by the main thing that's been coming up for me around this is i'm i'm kind of tired of pretending that i think it makes a big difference um i don't think it's that it makes that big of a difference but i do think it makes a small difference so i feel like you know pick your issues and make your vote based on what you think. And that's fine. That's how it's supposed to work, but stop making such a, a big deal about it. And mm -hmm. um, also additional warning as I was preparing for this podcast, I was like, you know, I think I want to say up front, like for people with sensitive ears and my mother-in-law, maybe don't listen to this episode. <laughs> so what I really want to say is don't make such a fucking big deal out of it and get some fucking perspective people. It's just a fucking vote. And the, the future of democracy and the future of freedom and the future of free speech and blah 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 is not on the line that's mm -hmm. stupid 
It's not true and it's dumb and I'm really, really sick of it. So make your discernment, vote for who you think is gonna be better. Um, there is, you could make an argument in either direction that either one is a catastrophe. You can make an argument in either direction that one's marginally better. I am going to vote for Harris. I've decided I'm just gonna say that and get that out of the way now. Um, oh, really? Yeah, um, I had decided I wasn't going to vote for Biden and I'm in a blue state and that I'm like not going to, I'm just going to abstain this year or whatever. Um, but um, in the end, I am more persuaded by Trump is morally depraved, uh, like Jason was saying, than the opposite. So I'm just going to do that. I don't think it's one of the most 10 most important decisions that I will make on election day. Um, I hadn't decided that until about yesterday. I was kind of like, ah, I might just not vote. I might just not vote. I might just not vote. And then I was like, fuck it. I want Trump to go away. Um, and so that's what I'm doing. Mm. Um, and then I decided, well, since I overshare on social media uh, <laughs> and, and the podcast anyway, that I would just in that spirit, just say exactly what I think today. So, okay. I'm going to, yeah, I'll approach. do, I'll do the same. So, um, I think part of it, I was talking to Dougal Hine about this, like part of it, I've admitted my own psychology, which is that I feel like I maybe came from a more right leaning childhood, went on this whole arc of like, le you know, being a good, like it, highly educated lefty. Um, and then I just saw like the lefties kind of go insane. And so I realized I'm having a reaction to that and dislike the lefties more right now just because I feel like a lot of the people I know who like Trump are like more relatable and normal to me than the people I know who are like hard into Harris um and I'm like going just totally on gut and instinct and like vibes with that um but I, I feel pretty ambivalent about national politics in general I think like just zooming out my whole sense is that at this point in empire, like we're talking to Jeremy Carl at the first wagon box event. And he was like, I think de deputy secretary of the interior under Trump. And he was like, there's all these people in there who have like big ideas and want, and you know, like well-meaning people, but like the vast majority of the work is just like cutting ribbons on the like lumbering bureaucratic state that's already going in a direction, you know? And there's like, it doesn't change a ton at this point in history. And so like, I'm not, I don't really feel like it's life or death. I don't think it's everybody. It's like your whole identity is, should be this, wh who you vote for. Um, but then I have like, I have a couple of, I have more little individual points of hope uh, in the Republican party than the Democratic, um, which is James likes JD Vance and he seems like actually a pretty thoughtful guy. Um, despite, <laughs> despite some of the, uh, despite some of the people who he's attracted and like dissident, right. I agree. Dissident, right. Stuff is very childish and just like the woke, right. Sure, um, I, I like Massey. I think Massey's smart. I like that RFK is at least, you know, whatever he's morally depraved, but he, there's, he's at least talking about like the environment and energy and food in a way that really appeals um, and so, like, I, part of me thinks if Trump got in, because he's so chaotic and doesn't have the bureaucratic state lumbering behind him, you could get one or two people in there who, like, have two thoughts to string together. <laughs> but again, you can hear my the ambivalence in this. I'm not, like, very hopeful about any of it. But that, that's basically where I stand. Oh. Jason, no JD Vance. <laughs> Hard no on JD. I don't like him. Um, I mean, he's very smart. I'll give him that. Uh, he's very intelligent. Um, but you know, he's he's been associated with Silicon Valley, um, mm. the Peter Thiel's and and that crew for a while. Um, <clears throat> and I don't trust them at all. Mm. Uh, frankly, you know, I think the the kind of woke right Silicon Valley set, you know, they're like their vision is a form of techno feudalism. Um, that's, if you, if you look at what they say, that that's, that's where they're pushing things. You know, they might say libertarian, but libertarian to the extreme degree, coupled with, you know, kind of the, <clears throat> you know, uh, hyper technology that, you know, would, would tend to accelerate the whole process. 
I, you know, it, it's not a, it's not an attractive vision to me uh, at all. And and he's very much associated with that crew. And so, mm -hmm. it, you know, perhaps we shouldn't judge people by who they're associated with and who they get their <laughs> money from. Yeah. But I can't, I can't look away from that. Um, yeah. We should definitely judge people by who they get their money from. Yeah. I mean, I, I take a more cynical point of view, which is that like, all of these bedfellows at the level of national politics and like the richest people in America are all so they have so many skeletons in their closet. They've done so many bad things. There's like no way you even get to these points without having so much like moral, morally depraved baggage that I'm just like, I don't know if I'm somebody who's got a will to power. I'm JD Vance. I'm smart. And somebody like Teal's willing to give me money and it's, and not with strings attached to like have my vision become reality. I don't know. I don't know if you take it or not, or if that like necessarily means that he's going to, he's going to like adopt his vision because he's taking money from, do you think so, Nate? Uh, that's one of my primary, like, I mean, there's a lot, I have a lot. I'm not, this is not a surprise, but like, I don't believe in even a fraction, a teeny tiny little bit of anything that Trump says. Um, and this would be the top of the list for sure. I mean, I feel like Elon Musk, when I look at things is like basically the opposite of my values. I mean, pretty much. And I feel like he's going hard in the paint uh, and there's a, that's happening for a reason. Um, and you know, so that, again, that Silicon Valley view of the world, I, I, I just, it's anathema to me. Um, and I do think, you know, you can only play footsie with that for so much before you're infected um and so that that's that's gross i'm out on that i mean are people um, not people don't care that musk is a transhumanist and he's like the biggest and most powerful booster of the trump campaign now i mean he's the founder of Neuralink. yeah right the, to to basically make us all into cyborgs like that's yeah that's, i i, I never like campaign i don't that's know what's the trump campaign yeah, I don't know what is attractive about Musk. To I will I will say, though, that the other side is, you know, Democrats are no better in, in terms of who they get their money from. I mean, big finance, uh, yeah. military I mean, industrial it's... complex at this point. Granted. It's it's yeah. bad, if not worse. And, and, you know, again, that leads me to my original point that I have no one to vote for in this election. I mean, I yeah. agree. I think, I think I, it's, I, the, it's the way structure uh, politics is structured. I don't think you can run a national politics campaign structurally without yeah. taking money from some pretty shady characters. And I think it's, you know, it, it speaks to the flaws in the whole system. And so for me, engaging with doomer optimism is like, we've got to, you know, we see a lot of warning signs on the horizon about how the status quo is not sustainable. And so let's let's start creating a new vision, you know, and as prefigure kind of a new set of relationships, uh, a new set of institutions, uh, et cetera, that, you know, is fit for the future. And the current national political system, I don't think is fit for the future. And so who we vote for one way or the other, both sides are compromised. Um, you know, I, 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 you know, if people want to vote for one way or the other, that's, that's your choice. But I just, at this point, I don't, I don't see the point. Like I yeah. got energy or maybe yeah. you know, if I do decide to vote, I'll go vote. And that'll be like 20 minutes out of my day. And, and then I'll keep focusing on what I think is really important. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's it's, a couple of, practical thing practically just going back to what Nate was saying if you're in a if you're in like not a swing state it doesn't really matter and so you'd be much better off focusing on like local elections um and making yourself aware of the various candidates where there's like actually some <laughs> chance for your vote to matter yeah it's for me it'll be five maybe ten minutes out of my day because as a rural voter I drive by the post the fire department on the way to work and there's no line and it's never taken me more than seven minutes to vote in my entire life of living here so it's pretty awesome and easy yeah, yeah. um so it's a really non-committal thing and you know i said about my vote at the beginning to get it out there so i didn't feel like i was talking around something i just wanted to be transparent but i'm not going to be a harris apologist i'm not a democrat apologist by any means right and if you're so mad at them that you can't vote for them i'm not going to try to change your mind at all that's not um I don't feel strongly about this election. I feel like I need to get on a side, right? Like I'm, I choose because I always vote and I'm going to vote, but I don't feel like I'm like, whatever, vote your yeah. conscience. Um, that said, I can share a couple of things about why I 
do I like Lena Khan and I, I feel like the Democrats have some momentum on antitrust. That's a big deal for me. That is, mm. that, I, that is a big deal for me. It's been a big deal for me forever. I feel like corporate uh, stranglehold over um, the rulemaking process in America is uh, tremendous. And I think, you know, attacking them via antitrust law is a very good thing. And that Lena Khan appointment has been a, I think, a really big deal in American politics. And that's momentum I would like to see continue. So that's like a nuts and bolts thing that I like. Um, I also like um, the, equip, the EQIP program. Um, I think that's a good program. I think I know from what, you know, I know most probably at this point about ag policy. And um, mm -hmm. I think the Democrats are generally better, generally speaking, although they, they have also appointed Tom Vilsack at the head of the USDA, who is fucking terrible, like just <laughs> terrible. But every USDA head is terrible, right? Like, so you, like the Democrats, or Republicans don't get a point or a minus about that. They all appoint a terrible USDA heads. That's just what happens. Um, but I think, you know, marginally, um, we talk about like where your money goes, you know, big agribusiness supports Republicans much more than they support Democrats. Mm -hmm. um, they Democrats get a lot of that money, but yeah. Republicans get m not marginally more. Um, and so, you know, when I think about farm policy, I have a preference. And, you know, so like that's, and that's how I'm thinking through this, right? I'm trying not to get caught up in, you know, these cult, like these, and whatever vote whatever issue is important to you but like i'm trying to just think through it a little bit i know that i'm not picking like good guys versus bad guys like it's 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 shades of gray versus shades of gray and like mm -hmm. whatever your your mileage may vary um i am voting against trump too like i said i mean i'm very i very much do feel that way i don't um uh you know completely unpersuaded by anything about the man um so that's kind of how I arrive at this decision. I'm not thinking like, oh man, I'm defending the Republic from fascism or whatever. Um, but like, there are issues that I care about that I feel like I have a preference around. And um, as far as a lot of the more histrionic stuff, I just don't believe it. Mm. Yeah, I mean, Jeff Schellenberger had this little thread about like how actually the Democrats were regulating chemicals a lot more um and people were saying like oh well rfk is on board now with trump and my whole question is like the theory of change behind all of this stuff like i just don't see i don't really know how any of these mechanisms are going to work like okay so we're going to talk later in the week with james um about like maybe some ideas for future events and maybe what Doomer optimism can turn into, if not just a podcast, we have a, a pretty strong set of ideas here that I don't think other people are really talking about. And I do think that that's really important. And we have a strong set of like the way things should work. And at this last Wagon Box event, Peter Allen and Hal Herring sat down together with James Pogue and we talked policy. And I wrote up like a two page, three page document based on that um that talk and Hal is like a con conservation environmental journalist from the west and Peter's like you know ecologist farmer from the east and the ecology in the east and the west are quite different so policy in these two different spheres is going to be quite different just because like you know rangeland versus farmland etc but you know they had some pretty clear set policies it was like uh, repeal this Mining Act of 1872, pass the Prime Act, uh, use like extension and equip um, as like an army to train regen farmers, take away subsidies or slowly wean off subsidies for corn and soy and for a chemical and, and industrial farming and toward these regen systems and using this already existing mechanism. Like there's all this specific policy we have in that we in our little circle have thought through and cultivated in a way that up, like left and right as currently constituted haven't so i have this three page paper who do i hand that paper to to get it in the hands of somebody who would actually who doesn't have two thoughts to string together <laughs> who actually might be in federal policy and a point of power and who would actually do something on that page? That's my question. I mean, I feel like if you handed it to RFK or if you handed it to someone like AOC, you, there would probably be equal likelihood that it would get taken up. And 
And which is like zero? Thing, well, maybe 1%, right? <laughs> um, I mean, that's the thing. If we're talking about environmental policy, I think the Democrats in general have been better in, in terms of especially, you know, chemicals and the environment. Um, Republicans have tended to just cut regulations left and right um, and, you know, have harmed people in the process. Of course, the left now, you know, big strain of it is the eco-modernist left, which has, you know, is it, horrible in its own special set of ways. Um, and so this this might change. I mean, you know, <clears throat> uh, uh, positions shift among parties, you know, over time. That's, mm -hmm. that's been known to happen. And so, you know, I... I don't know. Well, one, I, you know, RFK for for one is kind of a bizarre dude. Um, so, you know, who knows uh, what would happen even if he took it up. But then, you know, getting the Trump's ear again, I don't really trust anything Trump says as well. Um, I think he's just a habitual liar. He doesn't even see it as lying. It's just he he reaches for the most convenient thing to say at any given point, whether it's true or not. Um, yeah. And so whether he says, oh, I'm going to take on RFK and take seriously some of these environmental initiatives that some of which we agree with, I think, you know, Regen Ag, you know, he's focused a lot on Regen Ag, that's great. Um, but it's it's just, you know, I, I would say to base, you know, to, to suddenly claim, oh, now Republicans are the party of conservation in the environment. Whoa, 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 whoa. We need to yeah. see some real evidence of that. Like, yeah. hold your horses here. Yeah, um, you know, and I there are talked... parts of the left, sorry, sorry, Nate, and there are mm -hmm. still parts of the left that are, conservation environmentally oriented in a in a good way um mm -hmm. i would say that a lot of you know um and rcs and a lot of these programs are have generally been promoted more by democrats and maybe nate you know more about this uh but you know there is a strain of the left that that does really good environmental policy and is open to regenerative ag and more holistic ways of thinking about things i mean i see them at my university at app state yeah. app state is trying to be a sustainable focus on sustainability and a lot of people who are actually talking about like real good stuff tend to be more on the left mm -hmm. uh, i can't close my eyes to that either mm -hmm. so it, again you know it's it's hard for me to say yeah there are flashpoints there are hot buttons you know and um i think that's kind of like i was saying at the beginning and i'm kind of tired of tiptoeing around hot buttons you know because I'm, <clears throat> and, and i guess i just don't i want to stop pretending to care about those right and it just um there are, you know, important issues. And I've made my discernment and um, going back to what you said, Ashley, it's like, uh, well, the interview I just did with Austin Frick, right? His book is excellent. And I think it makes pretty much start to finish a fairly straightforward left, what I would call a, like a left wing case. It's not, I'm not saying he's completely left wing and I'm not saying the book is, is completely left wing, but it makes a case that is a very familiar case from a left point of view, um, uh, you know, about corporate consolidation, this and that. Um, and it's very coherent from that perspective, right? Like, I don't feel like so much has shifted. I, I, like you see this, you hear this a lot and you hear a lot from the dissident right people and whatnot, but how the landscape has shifted and there's this dr drastic realignment, which I don't believe yet at all, right? Because I still think there's a pretty fair, pretty straightforward, vaguely left look at corporate power in America right now that's still really pretty much intact. Um, and I do think, um, I hope things are shifting in a very real way, but I've been waiting for this shift to happen since Rod Dreher wrote uh, Crunchy Cons like 20 years ago, whenever that was. Uh, and I'm still really haven't seen it. Um, you know, this mythical right-wing uh, ecological consciousness, like I know that it exists, but I'm waiting for to actually see it do something like big. Um, mm -hmm. I would be the first to cheer if I saw it doing something big, but I don't, you know, I, I think the energy from this still basically comes from the left. And I am very concerned, like Jason was saying, and like, I know you think that the inner, the good energy that has come from the left is starting to be outcompeted by very bad eco-modernist energy from the left. Right. So I, so like, I want to stay in the left, which is more or less my home. Right. And fight for the good version of that. Like, that's kind of how I see mm -hmm. whatever political consciousness I have is like to drive that back out because i think there is very uh, uh useful and good perspective there that needs to be that needs to kind of win that internal battle mm -hmm. um and i don't it's a good question about how do we get these visions out there like um 
the conversation with Austin Frerich, uh, Greg Gunthorpe's another person that we've talked to on this podcast. I feel yep. like he's, uh, you know, and, and what you mentioned at the Wagon Box event, there is a very, I mean, if you, you built around subsidy reform, antitrust enforcement, truth and labeling, uh, inspection reform, like there are, there is a package of reforms, right, that you, that you have to govern to institute reforms. Like you have to not be a nihilist and just try to burn down the government. You actually have yep. to make, make something happen. Um, and there's a package of reforms that I think can help make agriculture healthier, more decentralized, less less um, top heavy with you know ethanol and corn and beans and all of that. Um, but it does require some sort of coherent action. And I mm. see that we're organized a little more on you know what I'm saying. I, I I still think the stronger energy for that is on the left. You know, and maybe maybe I'm wrong, and that's fine. I can be wrong. Well, okay. So here's another thing. Uh, to shift the conversation a little bit, which is, I think part of it too, is that all of us are pretty cynical about like this scale of politics doing anything coherent. And another open question is like, you know, what people constantly come in and say like, doomer optimism is left wing, doomer optimism is right wing. And like, in my opinion, I'm open to a lot of different types of people as long as they share some coherent sense. And I don't even know exactly how to describe that. To me, it, it has to do with like pro-environment, pro-conservation, like anti-corporate, like anti-overscaling corporate, you know, anti-overscaled government bureaucratic nonsense. And so um, to that, to me, it seems like one coherent path for doomer optimism to be expli explicitly political is to not necessarily do it top down, but to support regional, bioregional groups in maybe coherently thinking about themselves as a group who share this kind of ethos, work on a project together, and then you've got like these networks of people who, you know, have maybe seceded from the idea of like their coalition turning into some kind of national politics, but instead they're in an internal coalition. And then eventually that co these coalitions could form together and, you know, lobby their Congress people to pass the prime act or whatever, something on the federal level. Um, what do you guys think about that vision? I think it's good. I mean, I, I'm not, I also want, don't want to discount national policy, you know, I, I don't think DO should uh, excuse themselves from kind of national policy conversations either. Oh, Josh, Josh is here. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Got him. We hooked him in. Uh, Josh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll welcome you in in just a minute as you're connecting to your audio. Uh, what was I saying? Well, I mean, the fact that you wrote like this three page uh, kind of policy report, I think that's good. And I think DO can, you know, as you know, if we evolve into something more, I don't know, uh, legit. Explicit, yeah, legit. Explicit. We'll <laughs> see. Uh, I'm still, you know, I have to talk about that. But, um, you know, we could propose policy. I could see it being like a policy generation machine that any party could potentially take up. Yeah. Uh, whether, you know, and sometimes, you know, maybe RFK will see it and it'll be like, great. Or maybe, maybe AOC will see it. I mean, she's made sounds in that direction as well. That's right. And, and and it's like, fine, doesn't mean that DO is suddenly now it's, it, you know, it's associated with one particular political campaign. It's just, okay, you know, who's who's the taker here? And that could yep. shift in different elections. So I, I could see that as a model as well. Of course, what you were talking about before, Ashley, is near and dear to my heart. That's more of like the Cosmo local kind of vision where you kind yeah, of start, and, and start, what... start regional and then you network across regions mm -hmm. and then that trickles up. Uh, that too, but hey, Josh, well, are you are there? You there? Yeah, sorry. Um, I I I think I had it wrong in my calendar. I thought it was at one. My bad, you guys. No, it's okay. We're no, glad no to problem. have you here. We're we're recording. Um, and oh yeah, you're here. Okay, cool. Can we briefly so, summarize? Um, so so Nate is a is a true blue Kamala supporter. <laughs> um, I've said that neither party really, you know, is, neither is a party that I can really vote for, and I gave my reasons. And Ashley is a Trumper now, so that's where we are. That's pretty much the summary of the conversation so far. So yeah, we were. Just I'd say that that 
overestimates my uh my commitment yeah I'm and, not, and I'm ashley's not. commitment as well just, just yeah, i'm right. neither i'm neither a trumper and he's neither a kamala but i'm not even sure who i'm gonna vote for but we were just kind of like riffing on where we're where we're at um and you know thinking about i don't know just points of leverage points of power going forward um but why don't you josh um i said at the beginning that this kind of happened because of your prompting so why don't you just jump in and say what you what prompted you to, to have this conversation then we can go from there uh well what prompted it uh i've i I mean, I feel like I'm kind of watching things disintegrate in real time, and it could be because I'm just paying more attention, or it could actually be that there's sort of an acceleration of derangement that's happening. Um, you know, various things have kind of stood out to me recently as particularly wacky. Um, but I guess I, just to kind of jump to it, um, it was kind of a it really stood out to me when Dick Cheney and a bunch of neocons came out and endorsed Kamala Harris. Mm. And, and um, you know, the, the fusion between the neocons and the Democrats is not new. That's been going on for a long time, but just the fact that it's super out in the open right now. And, um, you know, from my perspective, so I've been calling it the, neo, the neocon Democrat fusion party, AKA the political death star. Like that is really to me the worst of all possible worlds. The establishment Democrats and the neocons on. So basically, we're going to continue to smash countries around the world to smithereens. And if you object, you're going to be called a transphobe and censored, you know? So it's, uh, it's like this is just as bad as it gets. Yeah. And so I kind of, and I kind of have started to, and like when, RFK and Tulsi Gabbard and other people kind of um, got together with Trump, you know, in this like weird kind of coalition. I kind of see that as for what, you know, for better or worse, that's our opposition party. Mm -hmm. That's the opposition to the establishment. The people who've been thrown, they're like, they're not invited to the, the, the parties anymore with, in polite company because they have heterodox views on vaccines or foreign policy or whatever. And so I kind of feel like to me, it really is the political death star that we're seeing take shape between the belligerent foreign policy, the censorship, the narrative control, um, you know, punishing of dissent. That's all really concerning to me. And I kind of feel like I want to throw any weapon at hand at that mm. to try to stop it or frustrate it. So I kind of feel like, you know, I don't know that I'd consider myself a Trump supporter, but a co-belligerent in the sense that you know, if I can fling Trump into the machine and he acts like sand in the gears, you know, I'll take it. Mm. You know? I'll uh, let Jason and Nate respond because they're like more ambivalent about Trump as this opposition guy. But I kind of feel I'm I'm leaning toward Josh in general, I'll just say, because I feel like the Democrats going together with like, you know, the Cheneys and all these people, it just it does feel like the uniparty. And then these others do, you're, I think the way you describe that, these others do feel like these kind of outsider misfits, you know. Can I, can I talk about a couple of other things on it that I think that they'll also want to respond to? Sure. Um, so, for example, um, I watched RFK's speech when he decided to suspend his campaign. And, yep. and, and go, I watched that. And I heard and, and I listened to an interview with him, I think, and Tucker Carlson. And he's out there talking about like some stuff that we've talked about, like um, the monomaniacal focus on carbon as sort of an, ex like the, we don't talk about the environment anymore. We talk about carbon and we talk yes. about solutions that are mainly like boondoggles that benefit corporations. And he's like, we need a much broader concept of the environment and approaches to the environment. And he's saying like, you know, we need conservationists. We need people who consider themselves conservatives. And we've often talked about how a lot of the sort of rednecks out in the country are doing more for conservation than a lot of the people expressing environmental values and stuff. Yeah. He talked about the importance of soil and the importance of regenerative agriculture. You know, and of course you can argue these are politicians, they're always lying. You can't trust them. Even if they mean it, are they actually going to do it? And there's all those kind of caveats. But I'm just like, hey, here's people, here's high profile people saying stuff that resonates with me. I don't expect to hear that. I'm glad. I'm just, I'm always looking for the silver lining. I'm like, I'm glad to hear somebody saying something I care about. Yeah. You know? And so, you know, so that's, so I, I'm kind of like, well, at least they're saying some good things. You know, if, if Trump says he gets in office, he's going to end the war in Ukraine. 
great. Like, I hope he can do it. I hope he means it. I hope he's not lying. I hope they don't assassinate him before he has a chance to do that or whatever. Like, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll have a little bit of belief that maybe something good will happen there. And, and then the other thing I feel like is, and I've, I've had a lot of conversations with other friends and colleagues and stuff. And I feel like I hear all these really weak arguments. They're like, well, Trump is a liar. Bernie Sanders said this recently when he was asked in an interview about uh, Dick Cheney's endorsement of Kamala and her response to embrace that and all that kind of stuff. And Bernie Sanders says, well, Trump is a pathological liar. He's a pathological liar. And I'm like, he's a liar compared to Dick Cheney? who lied us into forever wars throughout the Middle East that have killed a Holocaust worth of people so far. Yeah. And are, like that has got to be the most, one of the most consequential lies told in all of the history of us politics. So I'm not arguing that Trump's an honest guy, but tell me one lie that he's told that's anywhere near as consequential as lying us into forever wars. You know, he's corrupt. Okay. Sure. He's corrupt. He's a shyster real estate guy from Queens. I wouldn't buy a used car from him, but he's corrupt compared to Congress where people are enriching themselves massively through insider trading. I mean, like if that's like the world championships of corruption, is he worse than Congress? I mean, like put it in context. I want to hear the good arguments. And I feel like people who make arguments against Trump, they already believe he's horrible. He's orange Hitler. So there's no need to actually make good, strong arguments. I want to hear the good, strong arguments, mm -hmm. you know? I'll, I'll be persuaded by a good argument. I'm not really heavily committed to any particular position. I just want to hear the good arguments. And if it's like Trump's a liar, I'm like, we're talking about politicians in D.C., like they're Olympic gold medalist liars. So, you know, give me a better argument. Mm. All right, Nate, Jason, what are the good arguments? <laughs> well, to summarize, I feel like... Um... <laughs> We're already uh, so. What I I think you 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 said it was the um, what did you call it? The neocon. The um, neocon Democrat Death Star. Death Star, right? And we kind of talked at the beginning. I kind of feel like there's a similar thing going on with the uh, Silicon Valley, Elon Musk, Peter Peter Thiel, uh, J D Vance axis of Trumpism. Um, that scared, frankly, I mean, scared the shit. I mean, Elon Musk is public enemy number one, in my point of view. Like, I'm just like, that guy is a bad guy, and I'm not on his team in any way, shape, or form. He's also a transhumanist and the biggest donor to the Trump campaign. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm, I'm I'm out there. But also, right, so there's, 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 and, and like I said I th before, I think that there's, you could make the catastrophic case against either candidate. I don't really buy either of the catastrophic cases um, I think there's probably in the end a marginal difference between the two. Of, and so I'm looking at it, trying to look at just like marginally the things that I know and I care about, you know, and a few issues like, and, and uh, you know, I have to let go. Like, I don't have this Titanic vision of one against the other, right? Because it, I, th I feel for me, it's just as easy to make that Titanic case against. And I hear what you're saying. I am not thrilled um, about this, this mm -hmm. Dick Cheney thing. I mean, Dick Cheney is uh, extremely high on my, uh, you know, I think, you know, you and I are about the same age and um, experienced, I think, that whole thing about the same way. <laughs> Dick Cheney, bad guy. <laughs> Straight up bad guy. There's no ambiguity there. He's a bad guy. Um, and so it's not thrilling uh, to see to see that. Um, but, you know, I talked about things that the, the Biden administration is doing that I like. I talked about, like, they're actually doing something. Lena Khan's doing something on antitrust enforcement, and I want to see that continue, like, a lot. Right. Like that's probably my number one thing for, you know, like I said, I'm going to I'm going to vote for Harris this year, largely because of that. And I don't want to overestimate that. I don't think it's it's huge. I think it's like, like I said, not in the top 10 of list of things of decisions I'll make that day in terms of importance. Like it's just like, hey, you know what? I have two choices. I feel obligated to make one. I'm going to choose this, but I'm not going to pretend like it's Titanic because I just don't think that. Um, but I do like I want to see that work continue. Um, what I know a lot. I mean, I shouldn't say I know a lot, but what I know about relative to other things, I feel like is agricultural policy. Um, and I do actually favor the Democrats a little bit on that. Not a lot. I mean, we, we're talking about the party of Tom Vilsack here. So I'm not like pretending that they're awesome. I don't think they're awesome. I don't really like the Democrats right now. I have a ton of frustration and resentment with that party. Um, but it's, I, I kind of, I wouldn't even go so far as to say I want to, I would endorse, right? I'm just trying to talk through my own thinking and how I'm 
doing it. I'm not like, oh, I'm not trying to talk to anybody like, oh, you should do this. Whatever. I don't care what you do. I don't care who you vote for. I'm just trying to be transparent about my process. And those are sort of, for me, kind of reasons. And I'll just reiterate, I think I've talked about why I find both parties pretty impalatable. Uh, we use similar language, Josh. You know, the Democrats have become, I've called it the woke neoliberal neoconfusion. And <clears throat> that's just completely impalatable. I do think that Trump is morally depraved. I don't think that he's just a liar. I think he he doesn't know when he's lying and when he's not. Uh, has no concept to him. He's a bullshitter. I think that some some philosopher made an argument of the difference. And his connections with uh, the Teals and the Musks. Um, I also think, you know, I, I think immigration is a really big issue and we should have sensible policy around immigration. Uh, but uh, some of his rhetoric around that, I, I, I feel, is is actually quite scary. Um, and it could lead to kind of a, a more of a fascistic element in this country coming to the fore. So I'll put that out there as well. Um, mm -hmm. And he also bombed, you know, a bipartisan immigration bill a while back that might have gotten us closer to actually a real resolution. And he probably did just for political means. So again, I don't trust anything about Trump. The fact that he's taking on RFK, RF, RFK is already kind of a squirrely guy, but he has some good ideas around ecology and regenerative agriculture. I don't trust that he's going to, you know, take him seriously uh, when he gets in. And I, I think I'll, I, I'll, I've said that, you know, on the other side, it, when I've seen, there's a lot of wrong things about the eco-modern strain of the Democratic Party. Uh, and that's quite scary. But what I've seen just in like locally, in terms of like local extension and and where some of the good programs for regenerative agri actually coming from, they usually come from Democrats or they, they have up until now. And so I'd want to see the proof is in the pudding that the Republicans are now becoming the conservationist party. I, I, don't, I don't see that. But the main point I think that I'll just reiterate is that um, I, I don't see DO, I don't think it should take a side. Individuals can take a side, that's fine. But as an entity, I don't think it should take a side uh, um, because I, I think structurally of national politics, it's a lose-lose. The way that campaigns have to be funded is inherently corrupting. And I see DO as something that's creating, trying to create a new model, something new uh, that will, you know, get, gain more traction as what we all see is kind of the unsustainability of the current uh, political, economic, ecological system, you know, continue to break down. And so, you know, I, I think we can, you know, chat about this, but I, I think for DO in particular, I don't think that's where our head should be at. I think you could, you know, at least in a lot of energy, um, uh, you know, yeah. I'm curious to hear your take, Josh, uh, too. But one thing we talked about before you popped on is um, in that we have people who are like orbiting around doomer optimism, like uh, Greg Gunthorpe and and others who are like thinking specifically about policy and are like, you know, making friends with different politicians. I think Cory Booker, I think he's like friends with Cory Booker. I, I think he's done some regen ag stuff. Um, Anyways, and and in the last event in Wyoming that I um, ran, we had like a policy discussion and we like really talked about how would you do regen ag, how would you expand equip, how would you know pass the Prime Act, all of this stuff. Like, and I think we actually have a pretty coherent, nonpartisan set of things that we would like to see in the world, our little cohort. And I don't think we have a home yet still is my, my sense, not on the federal level. And I think that we could, I think we could make ourselves into like a constituency per personally, um, eventually with some like, with some organizing and with like maybe bioregional project or state-based projects or whatever. And then eventually we, we, you get like an internal um, identity as a group. Um, but I'm just wondering, yeah, that that's kind of where the conversation was going from there. Like, I I feel like we're the secret third thing <laughs> that is probably has always been an alternative. There's always been an alternative to the mainstream elite interest power broker, you know, desires, um, a populist strain, an environmentalist strain, a distributive um, power, uh, you know, self sufficiency. Um, Thing in American history and politics. And so I feel like we're just the iteration of that. And I think we do, I think there's a, a lot of us actually out there. Um, anyways, 
your thoughts, Josh. Yeah, I, I, I definitely agree with the idea that, you know, DO is not going to take a position or back a candidate or party or something. Um, I, I mean, I think that I think the stuff that we do and that we talk about is really common sense stuff, and it's it's familiar and acceptable to like all normal people, basically. I mean, I think a lot of what we react to, certainly what I react to, the whole culture war aspect of things, which is to me, it's a great deal of artificially imposed division mm -hmm. that are not really there and that break down. And so, like, yeah, if you're talking about regenerative agriculture, healthy soils clean water, trout, stream, you know, it's like these things just appeal to humans, <laughs> you know? So I think that it can be apolitical in the sense that it's a lot of common sense stuff that's beneficial that people can, you can come from a lot of different backgrounds and people will agree that these are good ideas. And, you know, like whatever Frederick Douglass said, I'll work with anybody to do good and nobody to do bad. Yeah. So we might have a different feeling about whether gay people should get married or something, but that's not relevant to how are we stewarding our ecosystem you know, right. or whatever, you know, something like that. So I, I, I definitely think that, and um, I think that, I guess my opinion on, I wasn't really aware that maybe there are some people in the DO sphere that have some of these potentially high level connections and stuff. My feeling is that like, and it, you know, it has a lot to do with just my personality, what I'm comfortable with and what I'm not comfortable with. Like, I really feel like I want to have experience doing something myself before I really try to promote it. Like I need to feel a certain amount of, it was just when I was teaching at the university, this was a horrible source of stress for me because there are times where I had to teach something I didn't have a lot of experience with. And I felt really uncomfortable. I was like, I need to go and do this by hand a bunch first, and then I'll feel okay about explaining it to people. Mm -hmm. And I feel like if, if the idea is that overall you have this neoliberal globalization and it's unsustainable and it's starting to break down in various ways. And the answer to that is that all of these different bioregional type projects that are where people are getting together at the community level, figuring things out and doing problem solving. To me, like those things strengthening up from the grassroots is really the way forward. And when those strong examples start to gel, you know, then I can see those connections to leaders and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. so, like, I feel like it's really good to have the positive examples kind of up and running and functioning kind of on their own terms, standing on their own two feet. Because we have, I mean, we've lived through this whole era. We all come from academia to a certain extent. And that's the whole thing where like, you know, you have some idea and then you go to, you go to, you know, the, the parents, right? The NSF or whatever, and you beg for money <laughs> to do your thing, right? Yeah. And like, you, you, like all these professors live off of taxpayers paying them to do whatever. And it's okay as a model, there's problems with it or whatever. But now it's more like we're trying to create stuff that is totally swimming upstream in the milieu that we're in right now. Like there's a lot of disincentives to do, you know, we had this conversation about, about farmer's markets and how do you sell your food and like trying to do regenerative ag and make a living in the food system the way it is right now is like insanely hard, you know, it's super hard. But I feel like, you know, so on one hand you could say, well, we need to get top down subsidies and all this kind of stuff. Maybe that's a good idea that would kind of help to bootstrap it or something. But I just feel like, you know, the world is gonna become a bigger place we're going to rely more on our bioregions and each other and our communities. And if we can make those systems strong and like learning examples, you know, then maybe reach up to the leadership from there is, I guess, my feeling about it. But I, I don't know. Josh, I want to invite you to talk a little bit about like the, you said you like to learn by doing, and I just want to, so if the audience doesn't know if they haven't heard his episode, that he's, you've done pretty amazing stuff with water sanitation in developing countries. Uh, you're, you're trying to bootstrap a farm now, sell the farmer's market, you know, and you're seeing the, the challenges there. You're also experimenting with like direct DC solar uh, to, to power things. Do you want to just talk a little bit about that just so the audience understands that Josh actually puts his money where his mouth is. Well, I was what I my response was going to be. Yeah, everything I do loses money. <laughs> I'm a big money loser. <laughs> brother, brother, yeah. So, I, yeah. I hear you. A lot of the past twenty or so years, I've worked with communities in developing countries on water and sanitation projects, and it's promoting local self reliance and do it yourself and low tech approaches and that sort of thing. So that, that's been part of my career for a while. Then a few years ago, we started this regenerative farming project trying to figure out how it's not, you know, this it's not just for aesthetics or for fun or as a hobby, but like, how can this actually 
be viable. And and it's 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 hard. Like I you know I I don't know that we're gonna ultimately be successful at doing it. It's got to be economically viable. It's got to stand on its own two feet. So yeah, I'm just interested in like I guess appropriate technology is kind of a overused term, but technology that's scaled and situated to particular contexts that works in, in particular contexts and kind of trying to demonstrate that learn about it and demonstrate it and and anybody who comes along and asks for help or whatever you know we want to want to help them um but uh you know i don't know how to i don't know really know how to do this and be economically successful but it's i mean it's like swimming upstream you know the economy is not made for this at all it's made for the opposite yeah. Well, but the opposite is breaking yeah. down, so we have to do something else. So at some point, you have to go out and you just have to pioneer the thing that mm. you think is right. Mm. Yeah, you know, and it and has to be viable. We have to make it viable, right? Like that has to be viable. Like you know, competent people such as yourself doing this need to be able to, uh, you know, make a living feeding people. I mean, it has to be viable. We have to make it viable, mm. and, and you know. So there's that question of like, oh, top down via subsidies. I mean, I, I, I fundamentally basically agree with you. It's all, you know, it's bottom up. But that being said, <laughs> um, you know, you say oh, it's pretty common sense. People want clean air. People want clean water, this and that. Yet we got here, <laughs> you know, and we got here largely because, um, you know, there's a real economic interest in the opposite of what people think is common sense, you know, and, and, and you've got, uh, you know, hog farms that over the course of the last 30 years have purchased uh, politicians, you know, and then run giant PR campaigns to turn it, it to turn, uh, to make it so it isn't about clean water, right? It's about family farmers being able to, to, you know, you know, the Farm Bureau uh, promoting the, the rights of family farmers to be able to farm the way they want right like that's what that has been flipped into um it's not and so like clean water you know illinois iowa the water is just disgusting filthy like disgusting mm -hmm. you wouldn't swim in it you shouldn't swim in it you shouldn't have your kids swim in it. it's gross um and you know that happened even though you know we, we say common sense is clean water well then apparently we are not a common sense people <laughs> because we don't we don't have it um and so and that's why i come back around to like like we have to attack you know like go for the jugular on these corporations that are doing this you know and that's that's where antitrust is that again it comes back to that to me that's if i had one word to say my uh, commitments in this election it's that word mm -hmm. you know there is something happening there is something meaningfully different happening on that front and i want that to continue mm -hmm. um you know and like I mentioned earlier, you know, subsidy reform is, is a big deal. Antitrust enforcement, um, we have to not let corporations just lie on their labels, um, right? That, 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 that hurts us. You know what? Made grown in the USA. That doesn't mean anything. You can put the, you, know, you can, truth and labeling is not a thing right now. It needs to be a thing. Um, so there are things it's like to just say, we have to build it from the ground up and ignore national politics. Like, well, no, we need that to happen. Like we need to, to, to throttle you know, the interests who have purchased the rights to keep people under their, you know, like small farmers, people trying to build something else um, down, you know, and so, um, and then I do think, I, I think there's also a place for smart subsidies as well, or, or like, you know, building like the way that Equip does, the way the NRCS does, kind of building the capacity. In addition to, I think the bigger thing is really attacking the, the interests that are, you know, have their thumb really heavily on the scale, but also I think the building up capacity um, is also a thing that can be done, you know, and actually relatively cheaply because, you know, you can spend a lot of money per, you know, on, on farms and things like that, but you add it up, it's a, it's a very small amount compared to how much they pay uh, people to grow fucking corn for fucking gasoline, um, um, which is I would, the worst I would policy say, in America. Yeah, um, I would say like to Josh's point of like, you know, bottom up versus top down, like my sense is like going back to the original doomer optimism way of thinking, like these systems are breaking down. And so Jason said this at the beginning of the this recording to prefigure what will come next. A lot of us have to do a bunch of stuff that makes no economic sense. Like we're swimming up totally upstream. Uh, but if you start, um, 
just actually trying to practically muscle your way through in the world, you get a whole set of thinking about how things work and could work beyond your little experiment. And then you can teach it, like you said, Josh, to your students. And so like having Peter Allen and Hal Herring, Peter Allen being like ecologically informed PhD farmer and Hal Herring's been a conservationist in the West for like 35 years doing actual conservation work and reporting about it. These are the kinds of guys who are like, it's like philosopher craftsman, philosopher farmer, philosopher conservationist who like, this is a, this is an, a deeply American archetype of a guy who's, who does things and then also can, can do the politics and do the philosophy. Um, and I feel like that's our group. I think that we have a lot of people who have a ton of agency and have like muscled their way through a system to the point that they can then share those those like you know hard won insights with others. I also think there are there are individual politicians who will listen to us, who are headstrong like we are. Like Massey is one of them in my mind. He's just a guy who's like, I don't care. I'm doing whatever I think is right. I'm just gonna do it. And I might not agree with him on everything, but a lot of his ecological awareness stuff is totally upstream of all of his colleagues. He's swimming upstream, nobody agrees with him, but you could get the ear of individual politicians. And eventually, you know, maybe some of these people come from states where it's like, where it's coming to a head and the old system's not working. And then now they're going to listen and we've got the answers and they, we're just waiting for them to be able to listen, you know? So that's the way I, I've always seen it is like figure out the answers ahead of time. And then when everybody else catches up due to whatever transformation we're in right now, we're already ready with the answers and then you come to them. You know, that's always kind of been my theory of change. And yeah. preferably, oh. you know, we have our act together to such a degree that we don't have to go to them, but they come to us. Right. We're not there yet. Uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe in a few years we'll be there. Right. But I mean, a couple of people, you know, like I think Peter Allen is probably there. Um, yeah. Yeah. But... I think didn't somebody like, I think a, a group came to him to ask him to talk to Congress about, I forget the name of that. There's a law. I forget the name of the law, but essentially you know, California passed a while ago a law saying yep. like you can't buy, you know, you 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 can't buy, you can't import from other states hogs raised in confinement, and you can't raise hogs in confinement here. Basically, I mean, there's more details to that, but that's the basics. The hog industry, of course, is pissed to have the call the California mark California marketplace taken away, and so they passed the law. You know, at the federal, they are proposing a law at the federal level saying that's outside of the purview of, of states to regulate, basically. So states and can't they, more Democrats or Republicans who are pushing for that, would you say? Oh boy, I don't know. I, I would bet, I would bet that, that that law has more support via GOP uh than re Democrats, but we should look that up. I don't know, maybe I'm wrong. I do not know, but that's my bet. Um that's a really good question. Um so but that that's the law. It would be states, which is a, you know kind of op, like a transparently anti-localist law, it's saying like states can't regulate this themselves. You know, um, which is a favorite move for corporations. Uh, you know, opposed to uh, you know fracking, like you can't regulate, like localities can't regulate fracking themselves. It can only right. be like lo lo localities can't regulate this. Localities can't regulate that. You know, that's how corporations sort of get around people who's like, hey, I want clean water. So or I want clean air. So you can't do that here. And then yeah. the, the feds come in and say, oh, that's you can't regulate that. We Well, we got that on a figure, federal level. Yep. And we're going to let the corporations write the law. So don't yep. worry about it. But yeah, he was invited to come talk about that. And he was like, oh, man, I got to think about what I think about this and like come up with what I want to say. But I do feel like there are points all the time of of agency and or there's a point at which some politician is butting up against some issue and like somebody I was t talking to recently, I think it was the National Wildlife Federation said they, or no, it was the Nature Conservancy, said that the Farm Bureau has an adopt the farmer program where they bring, or uh, adopt the legislator program where they bring leg legislators onto their farms and kind of lobby for, you know, chemical industrial ag and it's like, 
why can't we have a regen adopt a legislator program and have them come to our farms too? And we lobby on behalf of our system and what we would need policy wise to keep going on. So there's like, there's a bunch of little points of agency everywhere. And it's just a matter of like, I think self-consciously building a constituency who sees those points of agency and sees where they can like jump in on their local level or whether there's a, a senator who might be interested or a congressman or whatever. Josh, you were gonna say something. Yeah. Let me um, let me float an, a, 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 an idea about that, kind of off of what Nate was saying about how like the waterways that where where you are have already been ruined and like we've we've gone down the road we've gone to get to the place we are. So a couple points of light, like something I often go back to from blogger Johnny San Filippo, he says failure fixes itself. And so, you know, I think that some of the answer to this stuff is we we go kind of go through it and and the the, the problems for. I mean, we're not going to have unlimited fossil energy forever to do to keep doing what we're doing so we're gonna have to change at some point anyway what and what the concept that i want to float is to me i i think i really value i really value a particular freedom and that's the freedom to opt out and i feel like a lot of living in modern techno complex society is is, is this long project of con curtailment of freedoms to opt out so we had a good example where like oh, we recognize that hog confinement and consolidation into giant hog farms has caused all these problems. And, and, and so then California says, well, we're not gonna accept, we're gonna put a new regulation on top where we don't accept the, from that. But like, to what extent did that consolidation happen because there were prior rounds of, uh, of, of regulations and factors that caused people to not have the freedom to opt out? Like go back to Earl Butts mm -hmm. in the 70s and get bigger, get out. It's like yeah. everybody gets forced down this path it has various bad side effects. And then we layer on more complexity and more regulations to combat the bad side effects. And we kind of just get, build up this increasingly complexifying thing, yep. which I feel like, you know, if we were, if we could just live, if we just had a system where people, where you could go to somebody and you could say, hey, we have this opportunity. We're starting this new enterprise. It's going to be a huge business. It's going to blah, 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 blah. And somebody could say, oh, that's interesting, but I'll pass. I got my own thing going on. Whereas a lot of people have to choose what they choose because there's kind of no other uh, other path available to them. And I think that one of the trends that I've seen in recent years, I've followed so much Matt Taibbi's reporting and others about the Twitter files and censorship and government it, and you know the national security agencies infiltrating tech companies to enforce certain propaganda narratives and to suppress dissent on other kind of things. And so to me, like that basic like freedom of speech is so important because all of our other rights and freedoms, we have to be able to express ourselves. We have to be able to assemble. We have, you know, like that is really, really foundational. And I feel what goes along with that freedom of expression is also the freedom to opt out, you know? And so I wonder if like, because DO is like this real ragtag eclectic group of people, you know, <laughs> is, is, is a real basic kind of, you know, apolitical, non-marginalizing common idea that we could all have is the freedom to opt out, the freedom to do your own thing, the freedom. And, and my sort of Pollyannish faith in humanity is, yes, there's evidence of environmental destruction and all these destructive things going on around us. But my view is that's happened because people felt that they had no other options. Yeah. Their freedom to opt out was taken away or they felt it was taken away and they had no choice but to go down that road. And so if we could restore the freedom to opt out, I feel like that would go a long way. And my faith in humanity is that people will make good choices if they feel like they have the freedom and flexibility to do so. I, th I think that freedom comes from having a viable alternative, right? And I think that's kind of what you're saying, but that means that you have to have already a set of systems in place where if you wanna, if you're a farmer, you wanna opt out of kind of, you know, use of say chemicals or something or industrial ag, like you're not gonna make it, right? In, in the, in the mar or marketplace as such. Right, or it's going to be extremely difficult, and so I guess that's my that's just my question: is the freedom to opt out has to come with the freedom to make a livelihood or the ability to make a livelihood, right? And I think that's you know figuring that out, you know, among this whole network is you know that that gives you the leverage at the end of the day. Um, that's, isn't that kind of what we're trying to do in a way, in the most stated in the most general terms, recognizing that we don't have like yeah, it's 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 all pie in the sky. To tell somebody to opt out who's in an economically crunch situation, it's silly to talk about opting out. That's a privilege that most people wouldn't have. Mm -hmm. but 
when we're talking about swimming upstream, we're talking about living in a prefigurative way that envisions what's going to come next as this world continues to kind of disintegrate and encounter more problems. What kind of vision do we have about what comes next? How can we start laying the groundwork for that and making it increasingly possible with time and, mm -hmm. and figuring out how to build? I mean, we're, we're talking about not just say everybody needs to recognize our freedom to opt out. We yeah. need to rebuild the capacity for people yeah. to have freedom to mm -hmm. opt out because it's been largely degraded and taken away. And I think that starts with the with the power of the, you know, the, the positive example of, uh, you know, basically, you know, do we have proof of concept, right? And the more proofs of concept you have, and the people who are doing the proof of concept, you know, also can think about in terms of legislation or things that, you know, have kind of uh, ideas about how could this can be more broad scale. I think that that's it, right? And we're starting to, I think, one great thing about, we do about this podcast is we interview a lot of people who have become successful swimming upstream, right? Yep. Or at least to a tolerable degree, right? And I think that's, that's really, you know, and so at that point, then it's about, you know, well, if politicians start coming to us, whether they're, you know, uh, nominally on the left or the right, you know, we have something to propose. And I think, you know, your point there, Ashley, was, was really, was really perfect. Yeah, I mean, one thing I'll just say is that, like, in my various explorations of, you know, various movements that are adjacent to our podcast, I have yet to find one that's specifically focused on people who have been thinking about this problem for a decade or more. Mm -hmm. And like, just we are the, the attractor point for those people, which is amazing. I mean, they're like really psycho, pig-headed people, agentic people who have gumption, who have been thinking about this stuff, usually very, very intelligent, at least because they're like seeing beyond their own scope of their lifetime, potentially seeing themselves at a, at a point in history and then doing something about it. And right. so like, I feel very hopeful that, and I feel a little bit of responsibility, like we probably need to ramp this up a bit because we are like this attractor point of this group of people who I think have like a really unique um, place potentially in history to like, I mean, when, when in history did you have a group that was like, you know, able to be self-aware about the point in history they're in and try to prefigure what comes next? Uh, usually it doesn't happen, you know, and we do, we're in a kind of unique point in history where we can like assess these things. We've got so much abundance of like energy that we have all this scholarship that can help us like see our point in history and think about, you know, pulling the best from the past and bringing it forward, you know, and after this little blip of the hockey stick graph um, that we're in. And so I don't know, I just like, I feel very hopeful about that as the as the project of Dio. So does that have anything to do with voting for Harris or Trump? No, no exactly. <laughs> I don't want to bring it back to that. No, so exactly. maybe maybe I had, way, I had a way to uh, tie it back to politics if you want if you want to do that. I did, I did too. Briefly, Nate, oh, first. Can I can I because I did spend a minute because I wanted to answer this question right and I found out that the farm bill in its current form has two there there's two versions of it. Right. Um, and the Republican Farm Bill guts Prop 12. Um, it, you know, it, it takes away California's ability to regulate, you know, its own commerce and, and to regulate, you know, how. And the Democratic Farm Bill does not contain set, such language. And in true horrible Democrat fashion, though, Tom Vilsack is against is against allowing Prop 12. 12 to stand so he sides with the enemy as he always does he's the fucking worst um but the democratic farm bill as it stands leaves prop 12 alone so it is it does break down in the way that i predicted so my, my predictive heuristics uh were accurate in this one mm, congratulations <laughs> yes it's very important it's no i know important. it's true <laughs> uh go ahead josh uh well speaking of predictions and they'd already got he already made a prediction and got it right I was going to ask for everybody's predictions about just about upcoming events, the election or whatever, um, partially, you know, just for entertainment and because I sort of in initiated a conversation about politics or whatever. And then possibly if there's any tie ins like, well, I predict X and that might actually trickle down to where we as a household or we as a DO community or we as friends or whatever might have a perspective or a response or, or something, mm. you know, it may 
may not be personally related. It may be personally related, but I want to see what people's predictions are about what's going to, it's things have been crazy. What's going to happen? Yeah. What, oh, why don't you start? Do you have some predictions? Yeah, I think, I think the election is going to be rigged. And I think Kamala is going to be installed as president. I don't think that the deep state will let Trump be president again. I think the forces are aligned against him in such a way they've already shown that they'll use impeachment, lawfare over stuff, assassination attempts, anything and everything. The only way I can imagine him winning or appearing to win is if it's a total landslide, like it's so far beyond the cheatable margin you know, uh, where typically our elections are close, so it's easy to cheat and shift votes around. And Jamie Raskin already basically intimated that if Trump were to win, then before they could certify the election, they would move to get him on the 14th Amendment for insurrection and disqualify him. Mm. And I mean, so- Didn't he attempt an insurrection? What, when? January 6th? Yeah. That was definitely not an insurrection. It's ridiculous to think that. It was a it was a it was a riot. It was largely infiltrated by the feds who antagonized and instigated it. So it was a total psyop. Um, what it is, you've been I feeding think, off the right wing uh, media ecosystem. I, I, I can definitely tell. This fits into my theory of Trump in so far as I don't think it's like a planned insurrection, but I think it is the result of incredibly poor impulse control, an out of control ego. And an ability, an inability to lose, and therefore resulting behavior that was actually dangerous and completely irresponsible. So, I mean, if you want to use the word "it was an insurrection," I think that that might be overstating because I don't think it was a planned thing necessarily, like well thought out, like I'm going to overthrow the government. But he ha he can't lose. He has a terrible ego, and the behavior was fucking out of line. Like you can't act the way he acted in a freak. Like you just can't do that. But. Anyway, but anyway, it's predictable. Trump can say something crazy, and it's up to you whether you act on that or not. There was huge infiltration of federal agents in the whole thing. Yeah. This kind of this kind of psyop is run all the time. We have lots of examples of it. When it's run on Trump people, then the people are like, "Oh, wait, that's a conspiracy theory." But go back to the post 9/11 period when the FBI was routinely running these entrapment schemes on young disaffected Muslims to get them to have a terror plot and then bust them and make yeah. them yep. that and totally is legit. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. it's just being the same tactic. I mean, this hippies, is the, hippies and drugs I, before I, that, you know, it's, it's been, it's, yeah, it's the same playbook for sure. Playbook. Yeah. 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 Um, I'll, I'll, I'll just end with it. So I think that the reason that the narrative coalesced around specifically the term insurrection, it could, you could call it a right. You could describe it lots of ways. Uh, and we could debate how bad it was or whatever. Like now I'm not interested in that. Actually. I think that they specifically used insurrection because of the 14th amendment, right. Which was written you know, after the Civil War to stop, so because there was all these Confederate generals and politicians that could run in the, the reunified election and they could just make the country into the Confederacy. So they said, we don't want those guys. So we said, you're guilty of insurrection against the United States. You can't run. So it's a clause for disqualifying people. And I think that that's what was seized on, however organic or not organic you want to argue the event was. I think what was seized on was like, we can do him for insurrection and then he's disqualified and then problem solved. And my concern is I, I think if Trump appears to lose, uh, I think a lot of people will feel that it was rigged. Mm. But I don't, I honestly, I don't anticipate large eruptions of violence necessary. I, I feel like maybe I give Trump supporters too much credit. I feel like people saw January 6th, they've seen, you know, the draconian punishments against, like, you, if you riot for BLM, you get a slap on the wrist and Maxine Waters will show up to pay your bail. If you riot January 6th, you go to jail for 10 years. Like it's very big asymmetry there. I think people see that. They know about the feds baiting and baiting people into these kind of things and they're aware enough. But what I do worry is if Trump does appear to win and then they do the 14th Amendment and they invalidate him, or if he gets if he actually does get assassinated, I think we might be facing some serious unrest. And I think the establishment would love the unrest because that's an excuse to clamp down censorship. You know, like to use all that war on terror apparatus against our fellow citizens to to clamp down, you know, on, on, on dissent and that kind of thing. So that's that's my prediction. But I think Kamala's <laughs> going to be put Rosie. in. Rosie. And I think that uh, I think I honestly I don't know. I mean, I'm not a bit I'm not a Trump fan at all. But I think if he loses, I think he'll honestly think he'll just go away. You think, think so? 
Okay. And not this bullshit. I'm too old for this bullshit. I'm going to go play golf and go online and I'm going to shit talk to y'all. Yeah. And I'm going to play golf. And yeah. Yeah. Know, I kind of and, think that's how. Any other predictions? Um, I'm going to say, I think Kamala Harris is going to win. Um, I mean, just going based on the polls, I know the polls were, were wrong in 2016, uh, but the momentum seems to be on her side right now. Uh, if she does uh, appear to get more votes, I think it'll probably be more legitimate. Not necessarily. Um, there might be some uh, cheating involved. Um, but I think that in either case, uh, there there's a lot of conspiracy-minded people out here. And some of them are legit. There are true conspiracies in the world. But I think that the conspiracy uh, generation machine has been on hyperdrive. Uh, mm -hmm. For, for a while. And I think people, you know, create conspiracies out of nowhere. And sometimes they're based on legitimate stuff. Some, you know, oftentimes they're not. I think, you know, if she does win legitimately, I think that many people will see it as conspiracy no matter what, whether it is or not. So that's, that's my prediction. Yeah. I, I would say my, my sense is that there's just such an unfair application of justice in general now that it's just everybody's sense of, um, like mistrust in the mm -hmm. system is pretty much legitimate. <laughs> we don't have, we don't have a, a, a epistemological commons, so to speak. Yeah, Everybody right. And so, so like everyone has their own kind facts. of like, yeah, and nobody, nobody, like the, the institution of institutions have proven themselves unworthy of our trust. And so, you know, it's just kind of like one of those things where, I mean, I remember during Occupy Wall Street being like, this is an unfair application of police force. And now I think that gets used against the right and then like the left, you know, d gets to do their like Palestine sit-ins and make as much ruckus as they want. It's just constantly misapplied. And so my my sense is, yeah, I think people, they're just like continued breakdown of um, of like trust in the system uh, for sure. That's just continued. Um, I think Kamala will probably win. Um, and I don't think there will be riots. I agree. And, but I do think my bigger scale, like historical level prediction is that there'll be a bifurcation of people who like see what's coming and prepare in the DO sense and like keep clinging on to that. And then people who like stick their heads in the ground and keep going like turbo <laughs> capitalism, turbo whatever, um, you know, suburbs and high energy ex expectations of a high energy future and kind of relying on that system and my sense is that this that's like the real bifurcation that's going to matter a lot in the I do think if century. Kamala wins there will be a reckoning I, well I'm hoping that there's a reckoning within the Democratic Party um mm -hmm. you know just all of the corruption uh having to do especially with special interests um, you know, the fact that our physical environment is just becoming almost intolerably, you know, toxic at this point. Um, and, you know, the, just the number of disaffected people that those issues, those, you know, the real legitimate reasons why, why people are so pissed off at the establishment, whether it's the Bushes, whether it's the Clintons, whether it's the Obamas, whether it's whoever, that's not going away. The underlying drivers of that aren't going away. And one way or the other, there's going to be a reckoning. And yeah, I mean, do you totally think people... not going to be pretty? Do you think people um, are the um, only way they're staving off this l large disaffected class is by fear mongering and othering the other team? Like the only thing that keeps people from being disaffected is like, well, I just can't be them. And so therefore I'm these guys. But will there be a will there be a point that forces that to a head where people are like, you know, you're this is just fake. I don't know. I wonder. Nate, predictions? All right, so my, I, I would predict, and um, I think going um, a little different for me, I think I predict that everything's going to be fucking fine. Um, and that <laughs> if, if Kamala wins, she's going to win because she gets more votes and it'll be fucking fine. And if Trump wins, he's going to win because he gets more votes and it's fucking fine. Um, I, not being squarely, I think the person who gets more legitimate votes in this election will be Kamala Harris. Um, I, I don't, I don't think Trump's shtick is playing like it did in 2016, because I think it's not the same shtick. I think he was a genuine populist in 2016. And I think in 2024, he's a, I am motivated by a personal grudge and vengeance. And now I'm friends with Silicon Valley. And it's just not the same campaign. I don't think it has the same energy. 
um, and I don't think it will ultimately prevail. And I think it won't prevail because it won't get as many votes. That's what I think will happen. Uh, and what's the what's the Democrat energy like? What is get what? Is oh, the, the Democrat energy? energy is completely beat Trump. That's it. That's okay. it, it right now. That's all it is, and it's yeah. enough. It's totally enough. Um, and that's it. That's why it's it jazzed up. That's why it's like, hey, we're gonna paper over actual differences. That's why it's all that. It's just totally like, okay, we're galvanized by it's freedom. Uh, the banner of, of freedom and joy. Yeah, it's just one single-minded thing. That's it, and which is very powerful, actually. No, so one, one interesting thing, thing, and this is probably not interesting because it probably just has to do with trying to play to the general. That there's been a few articles coming out where you know suggests that the Democrats are getting kind of beyond the um, the the kind of what do you call it the the postmodern kind of identity politics where you know like Kamala Harris is not really identify you know uh, exaggerating her race right when people ask her questions about that she kind of brushes them aside again this is probably just a general election strategy. Uh, but it is interesting that, you know, and I hope that the Democrats at least are kind of getting to the point where they're beyond getting beyond any, any politics, right? Or they're, they're evolving beyond that to yeah. a more unifying message, at least in rhetoric. The Republicans, on the other hand, I feel like are just approaching peak woke, uh, peak postmodern. Yeah. I think that's going to take several years for that to play out. Um, I do agree. And I hope that my hope, my big hope is that um if uh harris wins um we didn't there was no primary everybody just united around this like beat trump thing right and and i hope that w when that happens i think there's a fair chance of it and i would love to be um uh I'll, chirping away <laughs> myself but i hope there's a giant titanic struggle for the heart of the democratic party um that's what I really want to see happen because I think it's very much, I think it is at stake. I don't think that every criticism of the Democrats is made up or whatever. Like when I, I'm not trying to be Pollyanna when, uh, you know, I, I think there is a big, big, big giant um, eco-modernist, uh, woke, whatever you want to say, problem in the Democratic Party that is threatening the things, the strains of left that I care about and I think have a good contribution to make. And so I want there to be a really big, huge fight about that. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, I'm curious. I actually am on team that I think there's a realignment happening that I really do think that I don't know if you guys agree, but like Cheney Democrats and Kennedy Republicans is the way I was, you know, somebody put it. And I'm just like, I'm, I'm just waiting to see because realignments have happened in history, uh, American history before where the parties just kind of switch. Um, so I'm, I'm curious to see if that plays out and maybe like somebody comes out of the Republicans that like becomes the 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 kind of politician I'm looking for. I don't know. I'm open to it. I'm interested if you guys think that there's going to be this big reckoning in the Democratic Party and a kind of you know battle for the soul of the party. I'm curious where you think that's going to come from because I don't. I feel like if they win, they're kind of like okay, we're like they're complacent. They're like we have control of everything now. Yeah, we well, the Republicans still have the judiciary. They'll probably they you know the good likelihood they'll win the Congress. Good likelihood you know a likelihood they'll win the Senate. It's still going to be a divided powers. I don't think that I I don't think they'll necessarily become complacent. You know they might just be dumb. You know they they might just double down on this kind of neoliberal neocon fusion thing. Yeah. Um, I would I would hope not, but that's probably more likely. I don't think they'll become complacent, though. That, that's the one Would thing. You, I, I think the, 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 the unity in the Democratic electorate is a mirage that is largely a function of single-minded Trumpism. I don't mm. think the Democratic electorate is, is, is actually very coherent right now. And I think it will divide. I, I don't think it has a single vision. I don't think it's totally united behind, like, yes, the Democratic platform is what we're for. I think it's very fractious and will fracture. But right now it's being held together by one extremely powerful motivation. So who do you see as being an inspirational figure in the Democratic Party that could drive the kind of change you're talking about? AOC. Oh, no huh? AOC. AOC's a fucking joke, dude. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not saying I like her. I'm saying that maybe she could be like a, you know. 
I don't know. Someone throw out Cory Booker as being kind of into kind of Regen Ag stuff. Yeah. Honestly, I don't follow politics and yeah. politics closely at all. Mm -mm. Yeah. That was part of my fear of doing this is like, I just, I'm not a, I'm not a that well-informed voter. I just kind of go by vibes and <laughs> I see the headlines. Yeah. I haven't followed that closely either. And I couldn't, I don't know a person, but I know that I feel, I know people, right. And my social mil milieu is like left people, like for the most part, like my friends, my family, things like that. Not completely, but a lot. Um, and I just don't, uh, I don't think the monolith that a lot of people think is there is there. I think it's again, single mindedness based on an election. And I, I, I think that, I don't know, I don't know what could emerge. Uh, I just don't think those divisions are, will go away. There's so, okay. Let me highlight this. And I agree with you that the electorate is more, you know, heter heterodox than, than the leadership. Right. I guess my kind of viewpoint on the democratic party as exemplified by a couple things, one, the COVID response, and the sort of like narrative, like the totalitarian narrative uniformity about the COVID response and the policies and the and the pushing out dissent and stuff. And also like the process that they used for putting in Kamala without, ha you know, they didn't yeah. even have a primary for Biden and then they knocked him off and they put her in. And when asked about it, they're like, well, we have, we had a process. We did a process was their explanation. And for some people they are like, are there supposed to be people voting for this thing? Or like, what in the world, how is this or whatever? I my uh, my explanation is that the Democrats, maybe more than any, either either of the parties, are very very institutionalist. They're all about the institutions. They're about the guardrails. They're about the process. They're about the procedure. And I think that one reason they hate Trump so much is Trump is this one guy. He's this personality. What mm -hmm. they don't like is really a personality of an individual person. Because I feel about like the apparatus, they kind of operate on a hive mind. Like there's this kind of like, you know, Russia is bad. We have to fight Russia. Russia's who's really responsible. I mean, it's kind of the question now, like Biden is not, hasn't been, really been president this whole time. He's senile. He's not making decisions. So who is, it's like a committee, a secret committee. We don't, it's maybe <laughs> Obama's involved or Tony Blinken or Victoria Newland until she left and went to Columbia. Like, I don't know. It's like, yeah vote for government by a secret committee that i don't even know who's on the committee yeah and I feel like they don't they don't see that as being weird or problematic i think because they're focused on the institutions the procedures the codes the guardrails the process and it's not down to like individual people taking responsibility so i guess that's my question about if there's going to be this reckoning in the democratic party i don't even know who i would address that reckoning to because it almost seems like a leaderless hive mind kind of Borg more than, a, you know, something directed by specific people. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It does. I don't want to clarify. I think, oh, go ahead. I think what I said, if I'm not incorrect, was I predict, I made the prediction about how it's going to go in the fall. But what I said about the reckoning was I hope it happens. I didn't go so far as to predict it happening. <laughs> There's different things. Yeah, I, I basically agree with you, Josh. I, I think the contrast with Trump is he, his decisions is whoever flatters him, whoever flattered him, you know, the most recently. Right? Yeah, it's yeah. More just kind of chaotic, which, you know, chaos can be a ladder for, for you know, for do minded kind of opportunities, but it could also be a ladder for several other things and you never, you never really know. Yeah. I will say that at least locally, it's generally the Democrats or Democratic more, more left who are more focused on local food systems, are more focused on ecology, most organizations having to do with like, you know, stream bed restoration and things tend to be more on the democratic side. So at least locally, and those those decision making processes, you know, there's a, there's actually a big trend of like participatory decision making and, you know, getting everybody's view on the table. Um, but I'm I'm again, I'm I'm in the Shire, right? Uh, and so, you know, perhaps it's it's I'm sure it's different out in other places and also at a larger scale nationally, but at least locally, um, that's what I see. Mm. All right. Well, this was a really good conversation, actually. And I think it, it was it we have no clear answers. All of us are a little bit ambivalent and cynical, but also hopeful on certain counts and and see points of action. So I think that's good. I think it's good to model this because there's so much team sports nowadays where people are just going on and on about like how bad the other side is without recognizing any of the faults of their side and so like 
just having a conversation where everyone's ambivalent and like has slight intuitions toward one thing or another is I think really helpful. Um, any final words from anybody before we wrap up? Nobody. <laughs> I'll, I'll say that I'm trying. I don't think I'm being, I'm, I'm trying very hard to actually not be cynical. I'm mm. trying to approach this without being cynical as much as possible. Like I've, I've been through cynicism a lot and I'm trying very much to, to not just automatically assume the worst of everybody involved uh, with, um, except Trump. And that's less cynicism and more like, I just and, see, and I Dick just, Cheney. that's just seeing evidence. Pardon. Sorry. For, sorry. And Dick Cheney. Yes. Trump and, and Dick Cheney. Cheney are irredeemable in my eyes. I'm sorry. They just, they both are. And I would also yeah. just say one thing that's, that definitely came out of this conversation is, well, I think we can all agree that how you vote is not the end all be all of everything about your personality. And like, I remember when we first got on Twitter, it was like, did you vote for Bernie Sanders? Like, who are you voting? And it's just kind of like, I don't understand why that's your full identity and yeah. why people are treating it as such. And so if if anything, we can all admit that that's the case and that we're not going to treat each other as like part of our team or a deplorable based on how people vote. You know, there's a million other ways to identify uh, your set of philosophies um, that I think we can all agree on. And ultimately, it 100%. makes sense what you're actually doing, Dio, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, in the the you know the informal or formal institutions that you're working towards in your own homestead or or neighborhood or county at whatever scale and yeah. that's 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 probably my big you know a, a thing that i really annoys me about a lot of democrats is that they hear that somebody voted for trump and they immediately like shut them off right yes. 100% yeah and i just think that's the completely wrong approach that's that from the very beginning of do we have been open to many different voices from many different sides. We don't see anybody as deplorable. Um, and people have a lot of insight from various directions. And we, you know, we have to, we have to take in as much good information as we can to, to really be able to move forward. And well, so, and you don't build like a, a full constituency by immediately calling half of the people deplorable and saying you won't even talk to them. Like, how do you build mm -hmm. some alternative third thing if you're not yeah. even willing to have a little bit of tolerance for people who might be different from you. And so. I would say the same thing in the other direction as well. I mean, yeah. there's plenty of Trump supporters who, you know, libtard is kind of funny, but you know, like that it is getting to that point in the other direction as well. So I just want yeah. to call them out as well. Yeah. 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 Uh, MLK maybe said that um if there aren't people in your coalition who make you uncomfortable, your coalition is not big enough. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. Yeah. I yeah. love it. Um, all right. Well, thanks, everybody. And uh, Nate, you guys do you want to say one thing? Well, I did want to say one last thing. It was in the it was in the email thread. And I think it would be fun at some point to reconvene because we what we didn't talk about was like you talked about predictions. And I thought it might be fun to make predictions about any uh, uh, on a more local level, just playfully optimistic projects we're involved with uh, making kind of like predictions even ambitious ones about where things will be. Why don't we, do we, ha, does everyone have five minutes? Can we do this as a final point? I didn't mean to open a can of worms. I don't, no, I we can do it. Guys. Let's just do it. I'm not getting any work it. emails, urgent work emails. So let's do it. <laughs> um, Nate, you go first. Um, that, you know, that our farm, uh, you know, produces, you know, we, we, in 10 years, all, you know, it's basically all perennials with occasional, um, uh, tilling up and maybe doing a, an annual crop here and there, but it's uh, about 300 acres of perennial trees and grasses and grazing. Um, and that we're bringing uh, about maybe $200,000 a year in beef sales um, in 2024 money, whatever that means in 10 years. Um, <laughs> uh, and $1 million. That, yeah. And that I have a kid or two back here, you know, helping on the farm. Mm -hmm. And um, and that we're growing a uh, really cool soccer club in the community that started from scratch. Um, and that we have uh, events every year where we have lots of customers come and gather at the farm. So that's mm -hmm. my that that's that 10 years. That's what um, that's my prediction for what will happen around here. Nice. Uh, for me, I I already see the outlines the seven years away in Uruguay back to Chicago, like I already see the outlines of a pretty robust local food 
system and scene budding here. A lot of people have chickens. A lot of people tend to their gardens and have vegetable gardens. A lot of people are involved in like going to farmer's market and buying locally. There's more and more of that. The city, like there's institutions involved in these things. Um, in Chicago, there's more and more just like interest in local heritage and like home restoration and all this stuff where like whatever the Chicago-ness heritage is that maybe people forgot about for a couple of decades, people are re-embracing it. Um, and let's say in 10 years, Doomer Optimism is a loose network of uh, chapters, bioregional chapters of people who get together and do ecological related projects and write policy and all the politicians come to us and we only take some meetings and we're discerning about who we'll, we'll meet with. <laughs> okay, this is a prediction, but also aspiration. So one, uh, the homestead, I you know, I finally want to get sheep and a lot of uh, my fruit and nut trees will be much more mature then. So hopefully we'll have a functional silver pasture system. So there's that. Um, my recent job, it's, it's in the education field and it's focused a lot on like empowering teachers with self-directed learning so they don't have to do like the, you know, the, the kind of standard one size fits all, uh, professional development. And also there's a lot of focus in this organization on students and, and just giving them as many options as possible, either with college or post-secondary, whether it's in the trades or whatever. And I really want to bridge kind of the background and food systems, uh, and the network I made with the sustainable development department, um, and this kind of new organization that's focused on education to, to really make this kind of bioregional field school thing uh you know um a real thing and i've started having some just just in the last few days some really interesting conversations with uh people who have a lot of leverage um uh you know both within the organization and people in the university that you know uh, i think are potentially interested um to start like writing grants and you know uh get you know leveraging kind of interdisciplinary kind of resources all across the university and, and in the community. So that's something that I want to make happen in the next 10 years. Mm. Nice. Josh. <laughs> all right. Um, the thing that came to mind for me was, uh, um, I continue to notice really interesting little tidbits of local texture in our area. And, uh, we moved here about four and a half years ago. A lot of the first part of that was taken up with COVID. So we we're pretty isolated. So it's been a slow process of kind of getting out, seeing stuff and figuring out the area, meeting people and seeing interesting kind of stuff. And the other weekend, um, there's a place we've been going to, to get seafood in town, which is, uh, it's like this little kitchen out behind the Elks dumpy building next to the train tracks <laughs> downtown. It doesn't look like a place you would go for it. It's all the windows are all blacked out and these old guys out there hanging out in the outside and they just opened up their kitchen. They're like, oh, we could just have a restaurant and we'll just, and they have actually really good seafood and it's really cheap. Uh, my, my wife loves crab legs and you can get crab legs there and they're really good. So we started going to this and then the in-laws came and we're like, hey, let's go to this seafood place down at the Elks Lodge or whatever. And we go down there and, and uh, we come out after dinner and out in the parking lot, a bunch of people had gathered and they were they set up like a WWF wrestling ring <laughs> and like a sound system. And all of this just like random cross section of America was mm -hmm. showing up. And I had I don't know what the story was about this. I don't know how people I don't I don't know anything about it, but it was Saturday night and they're having a wrestling match in the parking lot out by the train tracks behind the Elks Lodge next to the seafood restaurant. Yep. And I'm like. Man, that's just wild, dude. That's wild. And so, you know, pretty regularly I have the experience of like, I wonder what I'm doing. I'm an idiot. Why am I, why did I change my life? Why did I come out here? What, you know, I have a lot of self doubt or something like that. But then I have an experience and I'm like, man, if I wouldn't have gone on this weird path in my life, I never would have met that guy. And that guy's mm -hmm. fast or, some, mm -hmm. or something like that. There's a wrestling match out behind the seafood restaurant, just weird stuff. So I'm just continuing to be excited about all the weird local texture you can find out here uh, in, in, in the back the back end of America, I guess. Mm, I love that. Yeah, same. Um, all right, that was a great note to end on. Thank you, gentlemen. And uh, yeah, we'll see what happens in November. <laughs> see you this weekend, Josh. Okay, bye. <laughs>